Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and today we're talking about what to do if your husband drinks too much. I'm going to share three ways you can get him to choose you over alcohol. My guest Sage was so emotionally exhausted from living with a sarcastic, critical, demeaning husband who drank daily. No matter how much she tried to make things better, he was still an insensitive, drunken jerk. They separated for a year and she was headed for her third divorce. Instead, she took on a practice that changed everything, including the insensitive jerk who turned into a sweet, considerate man and a moderate drinker. She's going to reveal exactly what she did to get her dream marriage. And then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week, which sounds more like the voice of doom than relationship advice. And it will doom your relationship if you listen to it. All that is coming up. But first, let's talk about what to do if your husband drinks too much. Like anyone who drinks too much, your husband gets annoying and stupid when he's intoxicated. It might be nice if he never did that, but the bigger question is whether your man's drinking is over the line. Maybe he drinks every night or he drinks to oblivion on a regular basis or or else he gets mean when he drinks. Maybe he's missed work or family events or he's had run-ins with the law from drinking. Maybe when he gets started, he just keeps going on a bender for weeks. Aren't those indications that he's got a problem? And if he's got a serious problem, then doesn't that mean you have one too, since you're married to a problem drinker or maybe even an alcoholic? It's scary to think about because we've all heard about financial, emotional, and health problems that drunks cause themselves and their families. But does it have to be that way? In my experience, wives have tremendous influence over their husband's drinking. Knowing how to use that influence wisely can make a huge difference. Here are three ways you can influence your husband's drinking for the better. Actually, this works on any behavior you want to influence. So number one, take your foot off the accelerator. Of course, your husband is the only one who can decide how much he will drink and how often. You're not responsible for his choices, not at all. But here's what I've observed about human nature and wifely influence. When a wife tells her husband not to drink or asks if he thinks he should be drinking so much or complains about his drinking, I have never seen that result in him drinking less. Quite the opposite. He drinks even more. Author John Gray says it like this. When a man does not feel loved just the way he is, he will either consciously or unconsciously repeat the behavior that is not being accepted. He feels an inner compulsion to repeat the behavior until he feels loved and accepted. I almost feel like I want to repeat that because it's so, it really is so good. So John Gray again says, when a man does not feel loved just the way he is, he will either consciously or unconsciously Repeat the behavior that is not being accepted. He feels an inner compulsion to repeat the behavior until he feels loved and accepted. It explains a lot, don't you think? So if he doesn't feel that you accept his drinking, he will repeat it until you do accept him. Drinking and all. It's incredibly contrary, right? But here's what's interesting. That doesn't mean you can't influence his drinking. In my experience, you definitely can. The way to influence his drinking is to first accept it. Now, it doesn't mean you're signing up for a lifetime of smelling his whiskey breath while he snores contentedly after he breaks the lamp and knocks the picture off the wall. You're not agreeing to be the designated driver forever and ever. Amen. You are not agreeing to suffer endlessly if you accept his drinking. I'm not saying things will never improve. Quite the opposite. Accepting his drinking is a prerequisite to changing everything for the better, and it just means that you don't tell him to change. It means you stop punishing, resenting, and criticizing him for his drinking. If you want a husband who's sober and you've been telling him to drink less or to stop drinking, you are unwittingly pressing the button that makes him feel compelled to drink more. Pressing the accelerator when you were looking for the brake 
can have really negative consequences. So it's good to know which button you're pressing, right? Trying to control his drinking, even subtly, even mildly, is pushing the accelerator, not the brake. This is true of trying to control any unwanted behavior in your husband, in any man. So number two is to let him solve your problem instead of trying to solve his. So let's say you've accepted his drinking. Now what? How is that going to improve your situation, you might wonder? Does this mean you should applaud him for closing down the bar on a school night again? I wouldn't suggest celebrating it necessarily, but you might just treat it like any other part of his life where he's away. You might just say, hey, I was the pub last night in a light tone. The same one you'd used to say, I was work. And then ask yourself, what is it about your husband's drinking that's impacting you? And speak to that directly. But And this is the key, not as a complaint. So for instance, let's say he wakes you up at 2 a.m. when he gets home and you can't get back to sleep right away. So you might say, hey, can I borrow your brain? I'm trying to get more sleep lately and I notice I have trouble getting back to sleep after you come to bed and I'm trying to figure out how to solve that one. See how that's all about you and not about his drinking? You would want to say this in a a normal, neutral voice, you know, not a dripping with resentment voice. And then when he makes a suggestion, you want to be open to whatever that is and try it on. If he says, well, how about sleeping with earplugs in and you want to be able to hear the kids if they wake up, you can say exactly that. You don't have to do what he suggests if it doesn't fit for you. The goal is is not to be compliant The goal is to honor your own desires. And if what he suggests doesn't match what you want, then keep going. Say more about what you want. And this may seem like a subtle shift, but addressing your desires around how his drinking impacts you as challenges for him to help you solve instead of complaining or criticizing him, it's powerful. Don't believe me? Give this a try. Experiment with this in your relationship. All right, let's go to number three, which is to... Expect the best. If you're expecting negative consequences because he drinks too much, you're expecting the worst. You may have lots of evidence that bad things happen when he drinks, so this seems normal and natural. But since what you focus on increases, why not focus on how he hasn't been drinking as much or he doesn't drink anymore? Better yet, how about taking all of your focus off his drinking and instead focus on what a good listener he is or how reliable he is or how he seems like the opposite of what you're worried about. When you expect the best out of someone and you show them that you believe in them with words and actions, they tend to live up to your expectations. As you're listening to this, you might be wondering if I have even a basic understanding about the nature of addiction or alcoholism. And you might be thinking, but what if he has a disease? And you might think none of this will have any effect whatsoever. You might think I'm incredibly naive for suggesting something so dangerous. You are the expert on your own life. So you get to decide what is best for you. If you want to continue to try to control his drinking, if if, if what you've been doing has been working along those lines, then you're all good. But what if you've been doing something that feels exhausting and ineffective, then what could it hurt to experiment with another approach? One woman did just that with her husband, and she described him as an alcoholic because he drank so much every night. But she decided to start affirming her husband for drinking less and to tell him how much she was enjoying that. So she found evidence that he was drinking less, and then she uh, commented on that. And two weeks later, When we spoke, she was breathless. She said she was shocked that her husband hadn't had a drop to drink in two weeks. She couldn't believe just how much influence she had. You might also be shocked at how much influence you have to bring out the best in your husband when you use your powers wisely. Now, today's guest had a completely different challenge in her relationship and has a great story of using her influence to bring out the best in her husband coming up shortly. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. 
Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest Sage was so emotionally exhausted from living with a sarcastic, critical, demeaning husband who drank daily. No matter how much she tried to make things better, he was still an insensitive, drunken jerk that wore her out. They separated for a year and she was headed for her third divorce. Instead, she took on a practice that changed everything, including the insensitive jerk who turned into a sweet, considerate man and a moderate drinker. She's going to reveal exactly what she did to get her miracle marriage. Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, Sage. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to be here. So take me back to the bad old days. What was your marriage like? Well, in the very beginning, it was pretty good. I, you know, he, I saw him as kind of an intelligent, responsible man, and I, he was, parenting three kids uh by himself when i met him and uh was it was it was good for a while and then over time it just got bad so we were arguing all the time there seemed to be blame and criticism going back and forth he'd criticize me i'd criticize him for criticizing me he'd blame me i'd blame him for blaming me and um just felt like we were either arguing or there was a lot of distance between us. And then I was hyper aware of um, his drinking. He drank daily and um, sometimes to excess. And I found myself sort of walking on eggshells because I was afraid I would set him off that um, he would get, he got kind of, he never hurt me physically, but he would get kind of verbally mean. Um, And so, I felt anxious a lot and I was always trying to control his drinking. And uh, yeah, I just found myself just getting really, really tired. And I found over time that I, I trusted him less emotionally just because of all the verbal barbs and, and some of the harsh tones and that I found myself kind of withdrawing and and getting nasty right back. And um, just, it got bad enough that I just was so tired that I just said, I have got to have a break. And I moved out and I moved out for a year. And, uh, I thought we were headed for a divorce. Um, and in fact, we were actually meeting after the end of 12 months, we were meeting at a coffee shop to, uh, discuss splitting up our belongings. And in a rare moment of vulnerability, I, I said, you know, I don't really want a divorce. And he said, well, I don't either. And uh, so we decided to try again. And I moved back in and our old patterns just reemerged. We were back to arguing. We were, there was criticism. There was too much drinking. And I thought, you know, I just don't know that I can do this. I really want this to work, but I don't know if I can do it. And but shortly after I came back, I think within a couple of weeks, I went in this, I went to this sort of self-help seminar where we, it was kind of a dream building seminar and you were supposed to identify what your dreams were and you, you weren't supposed to think about whether they were practical or not, just what did you want? And, you know, what I really wanted was, you know, an amazing love relationship, you know, a respectful, um, peaceful you know, amazing marriage. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous. That hasn't happened yet. And we've been married at that time, 20 years, and it just wasn't going to happen. But anyway, I put it out there. They said, just put it out there and don't worry about how it's going to manifest or not. And, and shortly after that seminar and getting really clear about that's what I wanted, even though I didn't believe it was realistic, a Facebook post popped up with your information, you know, and I interpreted it as maybe I was being guided and as to a resource. And so I, I went to your, I went to, I I have audible. So I, 
downloaded your book, Kill All the Marriage Counselors. And I just remember being kind of startled, like it was getting my attention, like I could relate to some stuff. And it sounded so different than, you know, the marriage therapy I've been through, other books I'd read. There was just, it was different. And I just was sort of mesmerized and I listened to it like back to back three times and decided that I would start experimenting with some of the things in your in your book. What what did you start doing differently? Well, um when he had an idea, I I stopped improving on his ideas and I just listened and said, "Huh, whatever you think." Or I trust your judgment. Um when he would make a nasty comment, um I would either I would, depending on the comment, I would either say, I hear you or ouch, or um, I would just be quiet. And I didn't let it trigger me to start the circular arguments that it would have. It felt like what you described as bait. And for me, it was like bait. And I was a lot of bait. So I did a lot of duct tape. I did a lot of, I hear you, whatever you think. And I, and then I noticed uh, how I, had been, I would try to get what I want by complaining. And instead of complaining, I tried your, uh, you know, expression of desire. For example, I used to complain that it was so hot. We went to bed in such a hot room and I'd say, it's so hot. I can't sleep in here. I just, you know, this is too hot. And, and then I thought, well, maybe I'll try that thing that she's saying. And I, I remember saying, you know, I'd really love to sleep in a cool room. And up until that point, he would just he, he would just argue with me, and he'd keep it at a temperature that he liked. And that night, when I said that, he he turned down the heat, and he very uh, he put on this this ski thing over his head to so that he would be warm enough, uh, but it was cool for me. And it was like we'd been through that I don't know how many times, but not complaining and actually saying it in a way where he got to please me and I was so grateful and I expressed my gratitude. So I, I started talking to him differently, not complaining, saying, you know, what I want, you know, what I wanted. And I'd also started um, being grateful, you know, paying attention to what he did right, what he did well, rather than what he did wrong. And I, I switched up you know, I noticed my language, the way I described him, you know, I had a lot of what you called negative spouse fulfilling prophecies. And some of them were, he's an insensitive jerk. Another was he was a problem drinker. And another one was, is, you know, he wasn't trustworthy. He didn't have my back. And uh, so I started working with those and challenging myself to see him differently. So Instead of being an insensitive jerk, I thought, well, what did I want? Well, I wanted him to be sweet and considerate um, and thoughtful and, you know, sensitive. And but the thought of saying he's, you know, a sweet and considerate man didn't feel really very true because I could think of all the times that he would say what I thought were mean things. And but when I started saying that, think in my own first in my own head. And then paying attention, I noticed that he actually did do some things that were sweet and considerate that I think I hadn't given him credit for or I hadn't really noticed. Um, like he'd go out and fill my gas tank, you know, so I didn't have to. Or he would go to the grocery store and he'd pick up food that, you know, I was gluten free. So he'd pick up food that he knew I would want or eat. And those are very uh, considerate or um, you know, he'd change the oil in my car. So I, you know, I didn't have to deal with it or just, you know, little things. I just started noticing what he did or he, you know, make a fire because he knew I liked sitting next to a wood stove and, you know, and it turns out that there were a lot of little things he did. And the more I commented on him, that was really sweet and kind or considerate. He, he seemed to pick up his game and do more in that way. And, and in fact, if he did something that was consciously, he was trying to please me and I didn't notice, he'd say, 
wasn't that sweet and considerate of me? <laughs> I'm like, oh, Q, yeah, actually it was. That was really sweet. Thank you. So he'd remind me if I um, didn't tell him that because he really liked hearing that. And then we'd had issues. I had, you know, we had issues around his drinking. And at the time that we separated, you know, I just said, this is an issue for me. I feel like your drinking is your woman and you're, you care more about her than you do me. And I was sort of jealous of this drinking out here because it seemed to get all his attention and I didn't. And, and I was always, I always, I tried different ways to control his drinking. You know, I, I, you know, would lecture him about his health, you know, and how it's not good for him. Or I would tell him what he looked like when he was drunk, you know, that he was, you know, he got loud and obnoxious and sloppy and, and he, you know, and I tell him and I, you know, I bargain with him and say, well, gee, if you get your alcohol, I should be able to have a cat. And so I did all sorts of things to control his uh, drinking. He, he did let me have a cat for a while, although he hated it. Um, so I tried controlling his drinking a lot and I saw him as a problem drinker. And so I switched that up. And well, one day there was an acquaintance that visited our house and it was somebody who her husband and my husband had worked together and been friends earlier in life. And they were drinking buddies, hunting buddies. And I said, well, so how is Chuck doing? And she, and she started telling me how he started drinking first thing in the morning and drank all day. And when, when she left, I turned to my husband and said, I'm so glad that you're a mild to moderate drinker and that you don't, you, you don't let it interfere with your work. You don't start drinking till after work and that, and, and that you're so responsible. I don't have to worry about you, you know, drinking and driving. And, and he was so delighted to have me call him a mild to moderate drinker that he seemed to get more conscious of, how much he was drinking and, and I reinforced it. So I stopped, you know, like if he was over drinking, I just had new strategies. I would, instead of trying to control him, I would um, turn to my own self-care. I just say, Oh, I'm going to go walk the dog or I'm going to go take a bath or, or um, I just kind of found other things to do. And I sort of took my eyes off his drinks and put them on my own, or as you would put it, get my eyes on my own page. And I noticed he just sort of over time would, he still, he still drinks every day, but he doesn't get drunk so often. And he still does occasionally, it's pretty predictable. If he goes and visits with his daughter or, or a particular friend, he might over drink because they love to drink and tell stories. I've quit judging him about his drinking. I don't try to control it. Uh, if I get annoyed, again, I turn and just kind of start taking care of myself. And, and, um, and then when, you know, other times I just, I'm grateful. I just am. I point out what I'm grateful for and I sort of don't pay attention to what I'm not grateful for. And um, yeah, if that makes any sense. Um, It does. It does. There was a story I remember that really impacted me after you had started. I feel like you're the queen of the spouse fulfilling prophecy, Sage, and uh, you went on a cruise with him. I remember where your spouse fulfilling prophecy kind of. Uh, oh yeah, actually we were doing a um a little activity where we were going to go make I don't know mar- uh I, I can't remember. We were going to make so we were in Mexico and we were going to go uh, this class and we had signed up for, you know, included two drinks. And once we arrived, um they said, "Oh, for 20 bucks you could have unlimited tequila." And uh you know, margaritas or whatever they do. And he immediately jumped on it and said, yes. And then he, and then he paused and said, no, I don't really need that. Two is fine. And he didn't take the all inclusive 20 bucks, all you can drink package, which startled me because he never gives up an opportunity for all you can drink. And he did. 
And so there's more times like that. And uh, like right now, uh, as we are doing this, my husband was going to go over and have a, uh, he's actually having surgery tomorrow, but he was going to go have a drink with his daughter. And he reassured me, I'm only having one because I have to drive home. And I said, thank you. And um, so I feel, you know, if if he's going to over drink, it's probably going to be here because he's very conscious at my home, at our home, but he's very conscientious about not drinking and driving. So I'm really happy not to have that stress. So you trust him about not drinking and driving, it sounds like. Yes, yes. He's been just very solid with that. I think there was one time when I questioned like, hmm, I think I'd rather drive. And he was getting ready to drive. And then he paused and said, yeah, that's a good idea and handed me the keys. So, you know, he, he thinks about it and he likes being appreciated and he likes not being compared to those. And he, sometimes he'll, if he's at a bar or something, he'll go back and tell me about these loud, obnoxious drunks. And I'm like, geez, that's the way I used to describe him. And now he describes other people that way. And he doesn't see himself in that category. And in fact, he's not in that category, but rarely. I wouldn't say it's 100%, but it's nothing like it used to be. And every once in a while, yeah, he overdrinks, but it's not very often. And and it used to be when he overdrank, I'd walk on eggshells because any resentments he was carrying would come out when he was drinking. And so I always felt like I was a target. If there was anything he was mad at me about, it would come out when he was drinking. But now, if he overdrinks, he doesn't seem to carry any resentment anymore. And so I don't ever, I, I would say I rarely ever hear any negativity toward me when he's over drinking. Usually it's, it's positive or funny comments. Like the last time he got drunk, he, he said, he, he said, you know, I just think all my friends are waiting for you for me to die so they can snatch you up and they're going to divorce their wives and snatch you up. And I was like, okay, whatever. That's drunk talk. But it was sweet drunk talk instead of mean drunk talk. It's very sweet. He's saying you're a catch. You're a really good catch. So how is this possible? He doesn't have this resentment anymore that comes out. How do you explain that? Well, I feel like with the skills that I treat him with a lot of respect and he loves being appreciated and gratitude is, has become a habit, you know, and I, I keep track. I mean, I track every night. I, I write down wins. I, I write down gratitude. So it's, it's always in my consciousness. Um, every little thing that I used to take for granted. I I don't take for granted. You know, he just made some homemade hummus. Well, you know, he started to eat it, but he basically did it because he knows I eat hummus. And it's like, I'm so grateful. You know, he just, he tries little things and little ways to please me. And I try very hard not to miss any opportunities of to, to tell him how, you know, how much I appreciate him and, and all the things he does and the way he, you know, looks after me. and. Um, you know, shows his care and consideration. So, you know, I just, I feel like it's a culture or there's a different culture in our home. We don't ever, I don't ever criticize him and he stopped criticizing me. It seems like he rarely ever criticizes me anymore. He doesn't blame me anymore. He, um, and if he, if he has a rare moment where he says something that is a little bit sharp then I can say, ouch, or that's not like you. And, and then it, it, it just doesn't go anywhere that we're done. And it's, it doesn't, we don't get into the patterns we used to. So when I shifted my patterns in the way I have been in the relationship, being respectful, not being controlling, keeping my eyes on my own page, knowing when to keep my mouth shut, knowing when to keep speak my you know, my gratitudes, those practices have changed the culture of our relationship. And so it's just really peaceful now. And we've become so, so much closer, like, like there's a lot more trust. 
on both sides between us. It sounds like the emotional safety is really good at your house. Yeah, and bo- from both directions. Yeah, I find that nowadays he'll share with me, you know, like traumas from his childhood that he never told me before. And then, you know, we've been married 25 years and I'm hearing things that I'd never heard before. And, and I, um, and I, and I trust him. So I feels like he trusts me. I trust him and it does feel, it does feel safe. So it doesn't sound like he was a sarcastic, critical, demeaning, insensitive jerk in the beginning. And when you're, I mean, this is the same man we're talking about. He is. And the truth is sometimes he's still that way, but not with me. (laughs) He can be that way with others. And, uh, but it's like not on my page that who he is towards anybody else. And I let it go. I used to correct him when I, when he would be like, say mean things to our, a tenant or one, a family member or something. And I just, um, I reinforce, I, you know, say, I know you're a kind man or, or I, I know you're a generous person. And uh, I just sort of hold the vision of who I see him as. And he usually comes back and says, yeah, I was being kind of grumpy or, you know, and he, so he kind of comes back around, but sometimes he can still act that way, but not toward me. So you see his greatness and he loves what he sees reflected in your eyes. That's right. Okay. That's right. He really does. How is your relationship now? What's it like? It's, um, it's peaceful. Uh, it's close. Um, you know, we're dealing with the whole coronavirus thing right now. And, and this week he, he said, he said, well, I don't like being quarantined, but there's nobody I'd rather be quarantined than with you, which I thought was really sweet. And it, you know, there's a lot of anxiety in our home right now because he has medical issues and he's actually facing heart surgery tomorrow. And uh, I'm nervous about that. And I'm particularly scared because they don't let anybody in the hospitals anymore. So I can't even go in with them. And that's really um, frightening for me. But I, uh, we're close and I really love him and I feel loved by him. And that's what I wanted. You know, I feel like our relationship is amazing. It's respectful. It's peaceful. And uh, I like him. I find myself saying to him, you know, I kind of like you. And he can <laughs> me. He says, I kind of like you too. And so we say that a lot to each other. So, so we, we say the same thing. I say that to John all the time. I say, I like you. And he has this little song he sings to me where he says, I love you and you seem to like me. Which so it's, we joke about it all the time. It's it's kind of a different thing to like the person that yeah. you love, right? And love is almost like a decision, but like is kind of a um, kind of a fun feeling. It's like it's a pleasure, it's a delight to be around you. And that's what I hear you saying. Yeah, that's true. And your comment, um, one other comment I wanted to say is, you know, like when he's kind of being a little bit crusty toward other people. And then I I hold this vision of him being, you know, a kind and generous person and sweet. And he said, I don't usually get credit for that from anybody else, but I get a credit from you. And so he feels acknowledged. Like I see him, the real him, and that he has this veneer with others that can be a little crusty at times. And uh, but it's not really who he is. And. And in in fact, it reminds me when we first met, like, I don't know, when we first started dating over 25 years ago, we had this conversation and somehow it's a a rather weird conversation, but I asked him, what would you want your tombstone to say? And he said, I hope it says he became a gentle man. So I know that's who he wanted to be. And he's become a gentle man. Wow. And you brought that out in him. Yeah, these skills really made it possible to bring that out in him. And uh, I'm just grateful because I came really close to divorcing him. And I just had this nagging feeling like I had something to learn. And I did. I had your skills to learn. And it's made a big difference in my life. And I'm so grateful. You made your dream come true. Yeah. 
and you did too. <laughs> you were out there teaching me. And if I hadn't got hooked by your provocative book, uh, I mean, some of the skills seem sort of kind of hokey to me, but it's like, well, what I was doing wasn't working. So why not experiment and try something else? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, what, what would you say if you could go back in time to talk to Sage, knowing what you know now? Hang in there. You're right. There is some things that you still need to learn. And this isn't, um, this can work out. Uh, probably any three of those marriages could have worked out if you'd had the skills and you are doing the best you can with what you knew. And it was just a matter of learning a few more things. And so I don't think she was wrong. She just was doing the best she could. And uh, when you know better no more you do better and uh so yeah and what's your tip for a woman who feels like maybe um her husband over drinks he's got a real problem and she's feeling kind of trapped right uh like maybe i should be leaving this guy but i don't want to leave this guy what, what's your advice for her well i certainly wouldn't tell her what to do but i say that if she wants to make it work, that there is hope, particularly kind of turning her attention to what she does have control of. And that's not him. It's how she takes care of herself, how she, her self-care in both the physical self-care, emotional self-care, it's shifting how she sees things and maybe circling back around to what she most loved about him in the beginning and, is likely still there, but may have gotten obscured by the drinking, which was true for me. And that there is possible that um, the relationship can turn around. I, I mean, I really did not think there was any way that this relationship was going to turn around, especially if he didn't stop drinking. And he didn't stop drinking. But the relationship has shifted, and I don't have the same experience that I did before. And he didn't really have to change. He automatically changed as I changed. But it wasn't like he was consciously trying to change. He just shifted in response to my changes or my practicing the skills. So there's hope. There's hope. Yeah. What's the most important thing for her to focus on first, would you say? Boy, I I guess it depends on the circumstance, but staying on your own page and taking care of yourself for me, uh, self-care and gratitude and respect were all really important. But I mean, they all were. So it was relinquishing control. So, I mean, I, I don't know that I can say one thing. Um, yeah, I felt like I was multitasking. I felt like I wasn't one. It wasn't a linear process for me. It was, yes, I am focusing on my self-care. Yes, I'm focusing daily on what I can be grateful for. I'm learning when to keep my mouth shut and when to speak up. And uh, so it was, I, you know, I was playing with it and I made a lot of mistakes, but I could look in the rear view mirror and go, oh, I missed an opportunity there, but I give myself credit. That's a win. The notice is a win. And so I'll do better next time. And it was just, I don't know, it just was a slow process, but it worked over time. And you're a powerful coach now. How does being a coach impact your relationship? Well, it helps me. Um, stay accountable and fresh in the skills. And I, you know, I love working with women and seeing them go from, you know, discouragement or hopelessness to uh, a glimmer of hope and actually uh, developing some skills and feeling like they have some control over the quality of their marriages. It's um, that's a real treat and a real delight. Well, and these are these are really sensitive topics, things that we're talking about. I just want to uh, let the audience know, the listeners know that Sage is not your real name. And we did that on purpose because we really value privacy here. 
And, but you've shared some very vulnerable, very sensitive personal things with us today. And I just wonder uh, why you're willing to do that. I hope it gives somebody some hope that, you know, it can be different. Even though it doesn't feel possible, even if it doesn't seem realistic, you know, dreams do come true. And it's possible it can come true for other women as well. Well, you're sure an inspiring, uh, fantastic example of that. I so admire. I really heard a lot of discipline in your story, Sage, about how you continue, continuously do those gratitudes every night and you continue to look for the best in your husband and therefore you experience that and uh, have created that emotional safety to where you're the, the person he most wants to be quarantined with in the whole world. Uh, so I really thank you for giving us all hope today. You're welcome. Thanks for the opportunity to um, be part of your lovely podcast. I think it's giving women a lot of hope. Thank you. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at GetCherished.com. Go to GetCherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. And now it's time for the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week Award. It's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice. Yeah, it's the Worst Relationship Advice of the Worst Relationship Advice of the Week. And the advice that's got me ticked off this week is from an old song. It's Show him that you care just for him. Do the things he likes to do. Oh, I'm tempted to sing it for you guys, but I'm resisting. I'm resisting that. With apologies to Burt Bacharach and Hal David. Mm, I love you both. That's just not going to work for restoring playfulness and passion. It's just lousy advice. You know, neither is wearing your hair just for him while we're talking about that song. If he likes to golf and you like to rollerblade, You can go skating while he's putting, and then you'll both have something fun to report when you see each other again. And if he likes to fish and you like to swim and read by the water, then okay. It might make sense for you to go together, but only if you are looking forward to it too. No couple ever got happier because she gave up her interests to do something she didn't like so they could be together. I promise. What works way better is when you make yourself ridiculously happy And then he will be inexplicably magnetized to you and seek out your company and more. And for that reason, the advice that you should show him that you care just for him by doing the things he likes to do is the worst advice I've heard all week. Be sure to listen and subscribe to the Empowered Wife podcast. Next week, I'll show you what to do if your husband doesn't earn enough. I hope you're having lots of fun. Like that time I had a glass of wine and I decided to trim my bangs by myself because what could possibly go wrong? (laughs) 